Hey, money, ministry, and motivation. You know, the last video I did on relationships and how to find a mate, man, that, that generated a lot of views. I believe it's going to generate three, four times more than what this one is. Oh, there he goes. He's going to talk about money, ministry. That's not a subject a lot of people are interested in or even want to hear. Billy Graham said a very interesting thing before he died. He says, if you want to gauge a spiritual temperature of an individual, look at how they spend their money. And that's true. Especially in this country where we have so, so much. Well, I'm going to give some principles, biblical principles. I'm going to talk about how it's changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I'm going to give you some things to think about uh, very seriously when it comes to giving money to ministry. Okay? If you notice at the very top, I have here, how much do you give? In the Old Testament, they had a percentage, and they called it a tithe. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and Jesus greatly expanded on it from being a percentage of like 10% as being the basic tithe and then other tithes that they had to give on top of that to changing the heart of the matter from being a legal, lawful thing to being a heart thing. So today, what Jesus and the Apostle Paul says is that we don't give 10%. You give 100%. Because the idea is not so much in giving in terms of dollar amount. The idea is the concept of stewardship. And I'm explain that. But in Philippians 4.17, so basically what's happening is you give 100%, and I'm, and, and I'll explain how that looks in dollar amount. Don't get excited. Uh, you give the recipient, whether it's a church, whether it's a missionary, whether it's an evangelist, whether it's a Bible teacher, they are the recipient of your gift, okay? Whether it's a poor person, whether it's a family in need, whatever you or who you choose to give to. They're the recipient. If you do this biblically, if you don't do it biblically, it doesn't matter, okay? They're the recipient. But in reality, you're given to God. That's who you're given to. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 17, 15 to 17, the Apostle Paul makes that very clear. He says, as you Philippians know, at the beginning of my gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. He's really pointing them out as being unique, okay, among the first who was going to do it in a biblical New Testament way. For even in Thessalonica, on more than one occasion, you sent something for my need. They recognized the need, and they sent something to the Apostle Paul to meet that need. I do not say this because I'm seeking a gift. Rather, I seek the credit that abounds to your account. So what he's saying is, I'm seeking to benefit you as you give me this gift as giving to God and it's going to be credited to your account. You're going to get eternal treasure someday. Okay. In Matthew 6, and you have to understand this or you're never going to give in a biblical way that's going to reward you for eternity or even benefit you today. Okay, in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, it says this, Do not accumulate for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and devouring insects destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But 
accumulate for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and devouring insect do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now listen to this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it goes from being a percentage to being where your heart is. And God wants not 10%, not 20, not 50, 60. He wants 100%. Okay? 100% stewardship is about all. Because it's about a stewardship. You have to look at it like this. Everything you have, everything I have, if you're truly a disciple of Jesus, belongs to the Lord anyway. Jesus says, all those that want to be my disciple must be willing to give up everything. He, in turn, lets you manage it as a stewardship. Okay, and I'm going to give you some biblical principles on how to exercise that stewardship. But you need to understand the heart of the matter. Okay? It goes from being a judicial amount or an accounting amount to being everything. Everything you have belongs to the Lord. Okay. Three things here. Okay. But before I go in that, let me let me just let me just preface this one time. When I was in seminary, uh, doc, Dr. Campbell at the time was the president. And uh, he had sent out a letter uh, expressing the need of the seminary f for some money to finish out the year end. And he got a real rude letter from somebody that says, why are you begging for money? Why can't you just uh, do like George Muller did. Now, if any of you don't know who George Muller is, George Muller ran an orphanage for over a thousand orphans in Bristol's England. And he cared for those thousand orphans without ever soliciting or expressing any desire for people to send money. He did it in prayer and prayer alone. And what a lot of people don't understand, I did because I did a research paper on him, is the reason George Muller did it was not so much to run that orphanage, but he wanted to demonstrate that God still answers in prayer in an industrial scientific age that God wasn't dead. Every time you get an answer from God in prayer, no matter how small or big, that is a miracle. And he wanted to use the orphanage as a visible example in this industrial scientific age where man could do anything that God was still the person who provides for those who put their trust in him. So this guy wrote to Dr. Campbell he says why don't you do just like George Muller did and Dr. Campbell wrote back says well why don't we do what the Apostle Paul does and the fact of the matter is the Apostle Paul did a couple of things. Sometimes he asked, like he did here, for the gift. Sometimes he worked his butt off. He was a tent maker. Okay, I know many missionaries and pastors that are bivocational. Okay, that could use your gifts, but they they can't get by. So they they do it bivocational. In in Paul's case. He did for a while, all he did was make tents so that he could do ministry. And then other times, he went without. And that's generally when you go in ministry, what's going to happen? Okay, there's going to be times you're going to be dependent on the gifts of others, which is very humbling. Other times where you're going to have to work in order to support yourself and others. And other times you've got to be willing to, for a period of time, go without. Okay, so that's what Dr. Campbell wrote to him. Okay, when I went with Operation Mobilization in 1975, they required for, in order to go to demonstrate that God really had called us to this mission, that we raise our support, every penny of it, without telling a soul. <laughs> we had to do it in prayer and prayer alone. Oh my goodness. And it worked. It did. I, I, I never had been involved in anything like that. I said, well, if God wants me to go, 
you know, I guess he's going to meet that need. And he did it. And almost to the last day is when the final gift came that I had enough money to, to, to go with Operation Mobilization and do uh, missionary work overseas uh, for the whole summer. Okay, we slept in tents, by the way. We didn't have any personal money. And we went all through Belgium. We went through France. We went all through Italy during the year that they had that massive earthquake. Uh, it was incredible. And God provided our needs there, too. We didn't have any personal money. Okay, so there's three things I want to talk about. First of all, ministry is labor-intensive. One message by the average pastor, preacher, or teacher requires at least 20 to 40 hours of preparation. Okay, I'm doing three or four a week. Okay, and so, so well, Manny, that, that doesn't matter. But you got to understand something. There was a guy who built a porch and a deck for this homeowner, and he charged him $6,000. And... Uh, but he was fishing two days. And so the home homeowner asked him, how can you charge me $6,000 when it only took you two days to do this? And the construction worker says, yeah, but it took me 40 years to learn how to do that in two days with all the experience and tools and resources that I had. Okay, so that's how they do that. If I'm going to prepare a message, I come with many years of labor-intensive experience, as though most pastors and teachers that are worth their salt. You spend a lot of time doing biblical exegesis, Bible study methods, employing hermeneutics and prolegomena and all this other big word stuff in order to ensure that what you're teaching is strictly what God wants you to say. Okay, so you need to understand that ministry is labor-intensive. Missions, if you're going to go on missions, that's a lifelong commitment. Now they got it too. They have like short-term missions today, which I support. But for the most part, it's to give people, short-term missions, an experience so they can see what it's like, so they can come home and support missions overseas for the rest of their lives. They got a first-hand exposure of what's involved and, and what a lot of these missionaries go through and what they're exposed to, okay? And people that go on, man, they commit their lives to it. Many of them go, they never come back. I had a lot of friends of mine that I went to Bible school that are still in the mission field. They have never come back. Places like Papua New Guinea, China, Bangladesh, South America, in Europe, and now they're sending missionaries from other countries to the United States. <laughs> Isn't that sad? Okay. Ministry is labor-intensive. Missions is a lifelong commitment. Motivation is love expressed, not guilt or intimidation when you give. Okay. Let me give you some principles of giving. Then I'm going to talk to you about a little, a few dangers in giving today. Okay. Uh, you, you, you want to turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, let me turn to it in my Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Just hold on one second while I turn. Okay. Second, I need a new Bible. Second Corinthians chapter chapter nine. My Bible's falling apart. Chapter nine. And the Apostle Paul is going to lay down some principles. Okay, and he's going to talk about giving in love, not guilt or intimidation. If before I say that, if you remember the story of the widow who gave all she had, okay? And Jesus is giving this story. He's telling the story about this widow who uh, went up and gave two mites, and it was all she had, in contrast to this Pharisee who came up, said, hey, everybody, look at the money I got. I'm going to put it in the offering plate. He gave out of his abundance, and she gave out of her 
all she had. And he's making the very visual and graphic point, who's the one that really gave? She gave to meet a need and to give to God, he gave to gain man's approval. Okay, so let me give you some principles now with that as a backdrop. Principles that are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints. For I know your eagerness to help. So take attention of that. And I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Alcaea were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has steered most of them to action. The way they gave created motivation in the hearts of others to do the same thing. But I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be, for if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. It's going to make sure that what they said they were going to do is going to happen. Okay, so I thought it necessary to send, to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man, his principles, should give what he has decided in his heart to give. So it's not a percentage, like 10%. It's been changed. Okay? Each person should be able to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So a number of principles are laid out here. Because of the fact that it's a stewardship, your giving is 100%. Okay, everything you have belongs to God, right? Am I right? <laughs> okay, right? You're not hanging on to that. Okay. Oh, I got all hey, retirement account. I got all this stuff. <laughs> no, it's not yours. It belongs to the Lord. If you're truly a disciple, if not, well, then we, won't, we don't even need to talk about this. Okay? You're just playing games. Okay, now, the first Corinthians. First of all, who do you give to? You give to yourself, yourself, to the Lord. Because if you don't give yourself to the Lord, this isn't going to happen. Okay? So you got to make a commitment. What I have is not mine. It belongs to God. I'm just a stewardship. I manage it like a good manager does. Not squandering it, you know, like the prodigal son did. Or spending it on, in gambling. Or wasting it on frivolous things that you don't have or you don't need. You know, five cars in your garage. You know, you need to have the air condition on at 50 degrees. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to do all that, right? You're a steward. And if you're faithful and little, God will help you to be faithful and big. If you're not faithful and little, you're not going to give you big faithful. That makes sense, right? That makes a lot of common sense to me. Okay. Give the, yourself to the Lord first. You should give regularly, systematically. Okay? Uh, so you get so much... Every month you say, I want to give so much to the church or so much to this individual, so much to the mission. That's the way you should do it, okay? For God's approval, not men's. For God's approval, not men's. There's a church here in San Antonio. I went to, I couldn't believe it. And they're going to take the offering. And the pastor has, every Sunday, he has the people raise up their offering and, and wave it. So that everybody could see and they say, okay, now let's pray for that offering that God will bless you and then put it in faith. Now, here's these people sitting between this person here that's waving it and this person. How do you think they feel? 
Now, of course, the Bible says, don't let your right hand see what your left hand's doing. But that's intimidation. Okay? You don't need to do that. You don't need to make a show of it. Okay? You need to do it for God's approval, not men's. You want to give? You give. Okay? Now, sacrificially. Oh, man, this is going to cost. Not like that Pharisee who gave out of his mouth. I'm not going to miss this anyway. You know, you got a million dollars, you give a thousand, that thousand's nothing. But if you got a hundred dollars, and you give 80, 80 is a lot of money. That's sacrificial giving. Okay. That guy, what is that proving? It proves that you trust God. Now, of course, you don't do that, and here's the next thing, or without compulsion. In other words, you don't do that impulsively uh, without giving it a great deal of thought and prayer. Okay, you should never give without praying. Okay, and, and, and seeking God's guidance and approval on the matter. Okay, he, he wants you to give joyfully. You know, if you find out after a while that it's a true axion that giving is more blessed than receiving. How many times you give somebody and you feel, walk away from them, bless? That's what Jesus did. That's what God did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That must say, oh. That whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He met a need. He saw the need. He met it. He gave his son sacrificially. He did it joyfully. Okay. Without compulsion, as the Lord leads. Okay, now. Let me give you some warnings about some things. First of all, about the so-called prosperity gospel. And they operate on this basis of, uh, it, it, it's, it's called the law of compensation. That if you give 10%, God is obligated to give back 100. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible never teaches that God will prosper you financially, materially, or in any. It does say that he will meet your needs, not your wants. Okay, and that God will take care of you as you demonstrate, you know, faithfully and you give biblically as a disciple. Okay, so the prosperity gospel is a lie. And I would not give them any money whatsoever. In fact, when you do give people that, and or what they call sued fate money, all you're doing is rewarding their pocket, their lifestyle, and, and, and really taking funds away from people that really could use that. Okay. 501c3 uh, is a benefit if you want to get a tax receipt. But not all 501c3 nonprofits, whether it's church or ministry, operate biblically. I caught one ministry that was ripping off missionaries with thousands and thousands of dollars for many years. Okay, so you got to pray about it. Okay, you got to think very carefully about who you give money to and are they being a good stewardship of that money. This particular organization was not. Uh, they were caught. I exposed them. Uh, when I did find out and I confronted them, they denied it. <laughs> But they didn't realize that I had all the accounting sheets. They ended up giving what I could find money back, and we ended up getting it to the missionaries. Okay, so you got to be careful even still. The Association of Financial Accountability, Christian Association, is very uh, helpful that they had. I know Billy Graham had that. Billy Graham never took um, other than a salary. Okay, he didn't profit. He was not a for-profit ministry, and there's a lot of good ministries out there that are not for-profit, okay? They get a salary that is, that is listed by their board or their church and all that, and whatever extra money comes in goes in the general fund, and, and that's another thing. If you send money to a missionary, and on the check or whatever, you make it out to that ministry organization, and on the memo line, you say, well, I want it to designate it for a particular thing. They don't necessarily have to give it to that 
thing that you specified. Once it goes to the general fund, they have discretion to use it however they want. Now, it's legal, it's just not ethical. So ministries have a higher level of accountability than non-ministry or secular organizations, okay? So you need to make sure that your financial manager and the people that are involved in accounting and all that are really up to date and up to speed on financial uh, biblical principles. Okay, 1 Timothy 5.18 about muzzling dogs. Who should you give money to? Okay, well, let me read here. 1 Timothy 5, uh, 5, 17 and 18. Elders who provide effective leadership must be count worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard in speaking and teaching. Who do you give financial money to? Those that are feeding the flock and those that are working really hard at it. Okay, and then he says, for the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his pay. Okay, no guilt, no motivation, you do things out of love. Let me, let me give, give you an example of this, the ministry I do. Okay. I teach, I work really hard at it. I spent years training and learning how to do that. I didn't even know that that was my calling. God began to reveal that to me slowly over the years. In the ministry that I have right now, I have only three women that give a little bit every month. So let me ask you a question. Who's being fed? Seriously. If this ministry is feeding you, why are you muzzling dogs? Now, if I said that as a guilt or intimidation factor, that would be wrong of me. But if I say to you, are you being fed? Do you truly give out of love? Are you doing it out of compulsion? Are you doing it impulsively? I know people that do things impulsively and they'll give two or three months and all of a sudden it stops. Why? Because they're looking to get something in return, not to give as a means for, in the right biblical way, I am just a recipient of it. Okay? In no way, fashion, or form do I seek the gift as Paul did, said, because then it would just benefit me. And then you wouldn't have integrity in minute. God has already promised to provide all our needs, no matter what capacity or, or position you're in. Because the truth of the matter is, if you are a disciple of God, a full committed disciple, you're in ministry. He just designates those that are preaching and teaching as worthy of double honor. Okay, it's not a matter, as, as one guy from South America, a fabulous evangelist, he says, See, look, we're all in kingdom business. If you got a, jo a job at General Motors, that's because that's the best place for you to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. General Motors just happens to pay you to do that. Okay, but we place, and God places us in position as where, where we can be the best light and testimony for him. And he has a variety of ways, whether it's work, whether it's to the gifts of other people, or whether it's you go without. But God is going to give the increase, and he promises to feed and bless those that are totally given over to him. Billy Graham was not wrong when he says, if you want a true test of the temperature of a person's spirituality, look and see how they spend their money and where the bulk of it is going to. Okay, God bless you. Do what you want to do out of love and not on the convulsion. Joyfully, God bless you.